بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وأرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه وجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Over the last two to three weeks we covered the story of the Hijrah. The Hijrah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from Mecca to Al Medina. And so now we come to the arrival of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companion Abu Bakr to their final destination. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr were actually traveling in the desert at the peak of the summer season or in the intense heat of the summer. And so it was either August or September. And so their guide who was traveling with them took them down the valley to the outskirts of Al Medina to the area of Al Quba. And so Quba was a town outside of Al Medina. And so it was the arrival of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam here was the 12th of Rabi' al Awwal and it happened to be a Monday. The heat was extreme and the sun had almost reached its peak. And so the Ansar, they were waiting in anticipation. They had heard that the Prophet ﷺ had left Mecca. We mentioned earlier that the Prophet ﷺ leaving Mecca was a secret. And only this was only known to the family of Abu Bakr and Ali radiallahu an. It was known to only a select few individuals, but eventually when Quraysh found out and they started searching for him, obviously the news had spread to Al Medina. So the Muslims, the Ansar, as well as the Muhajirun, they were waiting for the arrival of the Prophet. The Ansar would go out of Medina every single morning, waiting for the Prophet to arrive so that they could greet him. But when the heat would become too much to handle, they would go back indoors. So they would continuously do this for a few days. And so one day, they went out early in the morning, waiting for Rasulullah to arrive, and when he didn't show up, they went back in. On that day, there was a Jew, who happened to be climbing on one of their high buildings. And he saw the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr in the distance, approaching, dressed in white. Now, why were they dressed in white? The reason was that when they had approached close to Medina, They happened to meet Zubair ibn al-Awam who was accompanying a trade caravan of Muslims that was returning from Asham. 
And so Zubair radiallahu an gifted the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr these white, these white clothings. And so imagine there was no better time for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to receive such a gift than at this time when he is about to enter al Medina and you know, he's about to be received by his hosts. So anyways, this Jew, he spotted them from a distance and then he called out, he shouted, O oh, people of Arabia, O oh, Arabs, what you have been waiting for has arrived. And so when the Ansar heard this, they immediately went to their weapons and they rushed to greet the Prophet now, why did they rush to their weapons? It was a part of their tradition. And so they would do this whenever an important guest would arrive. And this was also a sign that they were ready to, they were ready to show the Prophet ﷺ that they were ready to defend him and offer him protection. And that was the very agreement that they made with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa as we mentioned in their meetings with the Prophet sallallahu at Al-Aqaba and so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and his companion Abu Bakr arrived at the outskirts of al Madina in Al-Quba where people started to greet them now those who had never seen Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam there were many and so they came greeting the two of them but they would immediately go to Abu Bakr because he is the one who was talking while the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was with him and he was silent so those who had never seen the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thought that this is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until under the heat of the sun, some sun rays started to come onto the Prophet ﷺ. So Abu Bakr, he noticed this, and so he stood up and he started to protect, or he, he drew his cloak to shield the Prophet ﷺ from the sun. And so when the people saw this, they recognized that that is actually Rasulullah ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ stayed in Quba for the next 12 to 14 days. During this period of time, he built the very first masjid in Islam. And that was Masjid Quba. And this is a very special masjid. A masjid that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises in the Quran in Surah At-Tawbah and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned how if a person was to leave his home after making wudu and head out to Quba and then pray there two rak'ahs he would get the reward of making Umrah and so this is a very special masjid it is the very first masjid that was built in Islam by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was natural that the Prophet Sallallahu would arrive in Quba because Quba is to the south of al Medina. And as we mentioned earlier, as we mentioned earlier, Mecca is to the south of al Medina. So as the Prophet Sallallahu is approaching from the south, he enters al Medina from the south. And so to the south is Quba. And as I mentioned, this was in those days considered on the outskirts of Al Medina. As for today, then Al Medina has spread and encompassed and become, uh, Quba has become part of the city of Al Medina today. Now, the Prophet, وسلم, when he arrived there, he stayed in the house of Sa'ad ibn Khatima. Why did he stay in this house? 
because this was this house was known as the house of the singles and so he stayed there because he had a lot of visitors and so he did not want to burden a family with all the visitors and so the prophet sallallahu chose to stay there while he was there he sent messengers to al madina asking them for their permission to enter and so the response that the prophet sallallahu got the response that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam got was that they sent a huge delegation to meet the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they said to him come in both of you meeting him and abu bakr you are safe and you will be obeyed you can enter you are safe and you will be obeyed now what we learn from this is that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was not coming to medina as a guest the nature of a guest is that he is not the one who gives the orders he is not the one who is obeyed but rather it is the hosts who do everything and they are in authority and they are in charge but what we learn from this statement of the ansar that you will be obeyed is that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was not simply coming as a guest but rather as a leader he was coming to rule over them and we mentioned this previously when we covered the second pledge of al aqaba part of that pledge the terms of that deal was that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would not only be given protection by the ansar but he would be given authority he would be their leader he would be obeyed and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent every prophet every messenger to be obeyed وما ارسلنا من رسول الا ليطاع باذن الله we have not sent a messenger except for him to be obeyed by the permission of allah and so the role of the prophets and the messengers was not one to simply preach the message but on top of that for them to be commanding the commandments of Allah and for them to be obeyed so rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam along with abu bakr they now started to leave quba and they started to make their way to al madina which is only a few kilometers away on the way on the way they had to stop and that is because it was a friday and so on the way salatul jumu'ah became legislated allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the revelation for salatul jumu'ah to be to be started to be established and so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam stopped and prayed jumu'ah with a hundred men and so many of the scholars of Islam consider this to be the very first Salatul Jumu'ah in Islam. The place where he prayed is today marked by a masjid. There's a masjid there known as Masjid Al Jumu'ah, which is between Quba and Al Madina. Today, between Masjid Quba and Al Masjid Al Nabawi, but it is closer to. Uh, Masjid Quba. After that, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam continued on his way to Al Madina, and so he finally entered the city. Upon his arrival, there was a huge celebration, and so it was an amazing day. Everyone came out 
dressed in their finest clothes. People came greeting him. The men came out armed. The Abyssinians, they were dancing with their swords and their spears. Women stood on their rooftops. Children flooded the streets just to catch a glimpse of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, he says, the messenger of Allah and his companion arrived and they were among the people of the city. Even the old people came out to greet them, climbing on top of the houses and shouting, which one is he? Anas ibn Malik says, we never saw a sight before. We never saw such a sight before. People were very happy that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had arrived. Anas radiallahu anhi says, I witnessed the day that he entered among us, and I also witnessed the day that he died. And I never saw two days like those two days. He says in another narration, I witnessed two days. One day was the brightest day of my life. The day that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and Abu Bakr entered al Medina, And the other day was the darkest day, the worst day of my life. And that was the day in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away. He says, and I witnessed both. I witnessed both. So the best day that Medina had ever seen was this day in which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered al Medina, And so you could imagine the atmosphere and how it was filled with joy and with this celebration. Now, after everyone had greeted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, everyone wanted to have the honor of having him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to, to stay in their home. And so everyone offered that you have to stay with us. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked where his relatives were. And by relatives, I don't mean the muhajirun, because the muhajirun themselves are guests. The Prophet ﷺ was asking for Banu Najjar. Banu Najjar were a family from Al Khazraj, one of the two tribes of Al Medina. And they were related to the Prophet. ﷺ. How? They were related to him from his mother's side, or not from his mother's side. Basically, we mentioned previously, we mentioned previously that when we spoke about the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we mentioned that the great grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was Hashim, He went to Al Medina and married from Al Medina. So Hashim, the great grandfather of the Prophet, ﷺ, had married from Al Medina. And from that marriage, we have Abdul Muttalib. And we mentioned this previously how after Hashim had passed away, he went on a journey to Asham for business and he died on the way. But he left his son Abdul Muttalib in Al Medina with his with his relatives from Banu Najjar. So one of the relatives of Hashim went to Al Medina after he heard that Hashim had passed away. He went to pick up this son Abdul Muttalib and bring him back to Mecca. And when he did that, Abdul Muttalib, his name was not Abdul Muttalib. It was Shayba. But the one, the relative who went to bring 
Shayba back to Mecca, his name was Al Muttalib. When he brought him back to Mecca, the people saw, you know, who is this boy? They never recognized him. So they immediately called him the slave of Al Muttalib. Because they thought that Al Muttalib went and he brought, he bought a slave and he's bringing this boy who's a slave. So he was known as Abdul Muttalib. Anyways, the maternal uncles of Abdul Muttalib were from Medina. The maternal uncles of Abdul Muttalib were from Al Medina, from Banu Najjar. And so when Rasulullah arrived in Al Medina, he was asking for them. And so he recognized that, you know, it's going to be impossible to settle the debate. Everyone wants to host the Prophet ﷺ. And so he chose those who are most deserving of hosting him, and they are his relatives. And so when he came to Banu Najjar, he asked them, which of your houses is closest to me? And so Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, who was one of them, he responded that his house is right here. He said, this is my house, Ya Rasulullah, it is closest to you. Here is the door. And so that is how the Prophet wasallam ended up staying with Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu. Now, there's a difference of opinion as to how long the Prophet ﷺ stayed with Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. Some say it was one month, some say it was more, some say it was seven months before he ﷺ moved out and moved into his own home. Now, while the Prophet ﷺ was a guest with Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, he wanted to stay on the lower level while Abu Ayyub was trying to convince him to go upstairs to the upper level. And this was as a show of respect. And also because he felt uncomfortable walking over the Prophet wasallam, And so it could be that at any moment Allah sends a revelation. And so he didn't want to come in between the revelation of Allah and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But it was more convenient for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and for everyone else for him to be on the lower level. Why? Because people were constantly coming and visiting him. And so it would have been inconvenient for him to be upstairs. And so Finally, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu and he agreed. Now, Abu Ayyub, he says, one night, we had a container filled with water and it happened to fall. And so we were afraid that the water is now going to drip down onto the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he says, me and my wife, we quickly rushed and we grabbed our blanket. He says, it was the only blanket that we had. And we grabbed it and we started to soak up the water with it. And so he says, we didn't sleep with any blanket that night. And so this shows us, you know, the generosity, the, the, the love and the sacrifice that the Sahaba radiallahu an they showed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we will see many other examples of this of how the Ansar took care of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well as his companions from Mecca, the Muhajirun. Another example of this generosity Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhi says the first gift made to the Messenger of Allah after he took up residence in the home of Abu Ayyub, he says it was something that I brought myself. It was a big wooden bowl filled with bread, crumbled up with milk and butter. I told him that my mother had sent it, and so the Prophet ﷺ said, May Allah bless her. Then he called over his companions and they ate. Then a wooden bowl came from Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, 
it was mixed with it was mixed with bread and gravy. Zayd ibn Thabit he says, not an evening went by without there being at the door of the Messenger of Allah three or four people who would come one after the other carrying food. He remained there in the home of Abu Ayyub for several months. And so these were a people who were mostly poor. When we read the lives of the companions, we see that they lived very modest lives. They were not rich. And sometimes they would not even have food for themselves. And yet, they were doing all of this because of their love for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, what was the demographic situation of Medina like? when the Prophet ﷺ migrated. What was the city of al Medina made up of in terms of people? There were five tribes in al Medina. Three of them were Jewish tribes and two of them were Arab tribes. The three Jewish tribes were Banu Nadir, Banu Qurayla, and Banu Qaynuqa. We mentioned previously when we spoke about the history of the Arabian Peninsula, when we spoke about the different religions that existed in Arabia, one of the religions we mentioned was Judaism. And we mentioned back then we mentioned how the Jews had arrived in Arabia because they're not from Arabia so how did they arrive there and specifically in Al Medina we mentioned that when the Jews were dispersed and they were made to go into exile they went to different places they went to different countries a group of them who had studied their scriptures, they knew that a prophet was going to arrive and based on the signs that led them to al Medina. So they knew that a prophet would arrive and he would arrive in al Medina. So that is what caused this group of Jews to arrive and settle in al Medina. And so they were these three tribes. Banu Qaynuqa, they lived in the center of al Medina. The marketplace. And so their business was trading jewelry. How did they end up in the center of Al Medina? Because the other two tribes, Banu Al Nadir and Banu Qurayla, they lived in the outskirts of Al Medina, in fortresses built high. Because they always used to have battles with the Arabs, Al Aws and Al Khazraj. So they built for themselves huge forts on the outskirts of Al-Medina. But how about this one tribe, Banu Qaynuqa, how did they end up you know, in the middle? Basically, they ended up getting into a war with the other two tribes. And so those other two tribes kicked them out. And so that is how they ended up living in the center of Al-Medina. As for the other two tribes, Banu al nadir and Banu Qurayla, they had about 59 fortresses in which they lived in, and they had a fighting force of about 2,000 men. So this is the Jews. As for the Arabs, who are the original inhabitants of al Medina, they are al Aws and al Khazraj. And we spoke about them previously. Together, the Muslims among them make up what we know as the Ansar. They had a fighting force of about 4,000 men. One tribe lived to the north, while the other lived towards the south inside Al Medina. So, as we can see, Al Medina was a sort of a city that had many different areas, neighborhoods that were scattered. 
around the city. Each one specified to a family or a tribe. Now, the livelihood of these people, the people of Medina, it was different than the people of Mecca. The people of Mecca and Quraysh, their livelihood was business. They were businessmen. Whereas the people of Al Medina were farmers. And so their livelihood depended on agriculture. They had farms, they had date palm groves. And for that, for that, the farmers would usually need money. They would need cash. They would need this throughout the year so that they could produce their fruit and their crops. Because the crops only come out at one time of the year. What are they going to do for the rest of the year? So the Jewish tribes, what they would do is they would lend the Arabs money. But then they would charge interest on that. They would charge interest on that. And so this created some conflict and some bitter feelings between the Arabs and the Jews. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses this about the Jews. And they used to take riba while they had been prohibited from it. And so this was the situation of Al Medina prior to the coming of the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When Islam came, now Medina had Muslims, it had mushrikun, idol worshippers, and it had Jews. And so we can see now a shift in the demographics of the city. So previously there were only the Jews and the mushrikun, now we have the Muslims, we have some mushrikun that remained upon their kufr and their shirk, but they were a minority by now. And so by now, the majority of Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj had embraced Islam. Not all of them, there were still a few who had not. And then we have the Jews. And so, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had to be very careful with this new atmosphere, this new environment that he was entering into. And so there were some people who were not happy with the Prophet Wasallam's arrival and his presence. To give an example of the complicated situation that existed due to these various demographics, once the Prophet Wasallam came on his donkey to a gathering that included Muslims and Mushrikun. And so when he went there and he arrived, his donkey caused some dust to rise. So among the people was Abdullah ibn Ubay, who later on, so at this time he's a Mushrik, later on he becomes the head of the Munafiqun, the leader of the hypocrites. Abdullah ibn Ubay, he said to the Prophet ﷺ, keep your dust away from us. And so the Prophet ﷺ did not respond. He started to give them da'wah, he started to teach them about Islam. When he finished, Abdullah ibn Ubay, once again he said, do not come and bother us in our meetings with your talk, Stay home, and whoever comes to you, then tell them your stories. But don't come to us. And so, one of the companions, Abdullah ibn Rawaha, he said, no, we want him to come to our meetings, our gatherings, and we want him to talk to us. So then the people started shouting and arguing. It was as if a huge battle was about to erupt. And so the Prophet ﷺ started to calm them down. Later on, the Prophet ﷺ met Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, one of the leaders of the Ansar. And he asked him, didn't you see what Abdullah ibn Ubay did? 
Sa'ad asked him what happened. And when he heard what happened, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, he said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Messenger of Allah, Abdullah ibn Ubay was a man whom his people were about to appoint him as a leader over them when you had arrived. And so he feels that you stripped him of his leadership and his authority. And so Sa'ad radiallahu an was explaining how it was understandable that Abdullah ibn Ubay acted the way he did against the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? Because Al-Khazraj, Abdullah ibn Ubay was from the tribe of Al-Khazraj and they were about to appoint him as a leader over them. We mentioned previously that the majority of the leaders of Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj had been wiped out in a major battle that took place. These two tribes, they were always fighting one another and on one occasion, all of their leaders had been killed. And so they were without any leaders. And we mentioned previously that this was one of the factors that led them to embrace Islam so quickly and accept the Prophet ﷺ because they were without any leadership. And usually, people are warded away from the truth and they're told not to follow the truth because of their leaders who want to hold on to their power. But Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj, they saw that the Prophet ﷺ could unite them and how he could be a leader for them. And so this was a situation that Rasulullah ﷺ was dealing with when he arrived in Al-Madina. On the other hand, there were some non-Muslims who were waiting in anticipation for the Prophet ﷺ so that they could confirm what they had heard about him. And if it happens to be true, they were ready to embrace Islam. And we mentioned one example of this previously. We mentioned an example of this previously, and that was the example of Salman al-Farisi radiallahu an. We mentioned his story, his entire story, his journey that he took all the way from Persia, where he went from one monk to another in search of the truth. The last monk that he stayed with in Turkey and in the Middle East told him that there is no one, there is no one to, to follow after I die, but there is a prophet that is about to come. And these are his signs. He gave him his signs. Certain signs that you can recognize that this is him. And then we mentioned how Salman radiallahu an, he became, you know, he was taken as a, a prisoner and he was made into a slave. And then he ended up as a slave of one of the Jews of Al-Madinah. And then on the day that the Prophet ﷺ arrived in Al-Madinah, and he heard that the Prophet ﷺ had arrived, he immediately went to meet him. And then he started to test the Prophet ﷺ. He, he was testing those signs that he had been told. For example, that he is a man who does not, he will not accept Sadaqa, but he will accept gifts. So he came and he gave him, he gave him Sadaqa, but the Prophet ﷺ gave it to the companions. The next day, Salman came instead with a gift of food, and the Prophet ﷺ ate it. And so he went through one sign after the other until finally he was satisfied. And he said his shahada. And the Prophet ﷺ was so happy when he heard the story of Salman al-Farisi and he told him to tell his story to all the companions. Another example, another example was that of Abdullah ibn Salam. Abdullah ibn Salam was a Jew and he was one of their leaders. 
And he was also well versed in the Torah. So he was also waiting for the Prophet And so he says, when the Prophet arrived in Al Medina, everyone rushed to see him. I also went to look at him. When I saw his face, I immediately saw that it was not the face of any liar. The first thing that I heard him say was, Ya ayyuhan nas, afshu salam, wa swilu al arham, wa at'imu al ta'am, wa sallu bil layli wa nasu niyam, tadkhulu al jannata bi salamin. This famous hadith in which the Prophet says, O oh people, spread salam among you, join the ties of kinship, feed people with food, pray at night when everyone is asleep, you will enter Jannah in peace. In Sahih al-Bukhari, Anas radiallahu anh says, when the news of the arrival of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in Medina reached Abdullah ibn Salam, he went to ask about certain things. He went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to ask him, to test him, to see is he a true Prophet or not. And so he said, I am going to ask you about three things which only a Prophet can answer. What is the first sign of the hour, of the Day of Judgment? What is the first food which the people of Jannah will eat? And the third question, why does a child attract the similarity to his father or to his mother? Abdullah ibn Salam, we said, was a scholar. He was well versed in the Torah. And so he had this knowledge. And so he wanted to see. And so Jibreel came and gave the answers to the Prophet ﷺ. And after the Prophet ﷺ gave Abdullah ibn Salam the answers, he immediately said his shahada. Then he said, O Messenger of Allah, the Jews, they invent such lies that make one astonished. So please ask them about me before they know about my conversion to Islam. And so the Jews, they came and the Prophet ﷺ said, What kind of man is Abdullah ibn Salam among you? So they replied, He is the best of us. He is the son of the best of us. He is the most superior among us. And he is the son of the most superior among us. The Prophet ﷺ then said, What do you think if Abdullah ibn Salam should embrace Islam? They said, May Allah protect him from that. The Prophet ﷺ repeated his question and they gave the same answer. Then Abdullah ibn Salam came out and he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah When the Jews heard this they said he is the most wicked among us and the son of the most wicked among us Abdullah ibn Salam said to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam O messenger of Allah it is this that I was afraid of And so This is a second example of how there were some people who were waiting for the arrival of the Prophet ﷺ so that they could see whether he had brought the truth from Allah or not. And when they saw that indeed he was a messenger from Allah, they immediately embraced Islam. Now, the difficult circumstances of the Hijrah and the new home in Al Medina was something that the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, the Muhajirun from Mecca, had to adapt to. It was not easy. We have to understand that the Hijrah was not some kind of getaway, it was not some kind of you know, fun trip where we travel, leave home to enjoy. Rather, it was a sacrifice. 
leaving behind your home, your family, your friends, your businesses, leaving everything behind. All of that for the sake of what you believe in. And so this is why it came at the very end. After Iman was embedded in the hearts and the persecution had reached its limits and they remained firm upon their Iman. Now Allah ordered them to make the Hijrah. Add to that the fact that the Muhajirun went through so much difficulty adapting to this climate, the climate of Al-Madinah. Aisha radiallahu anha, she described Medina as being one of the most plagued places on earth. Many of the Muhajirun, when they arrived in al Medina, they immediately fell ill. And they had severe fever. <coughs> Among them was Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, and Bilal radiallahu anh. It reached the point where many of them could no longer pray standing. So they would pray sitting. When they had heard that by praying sitting, we only get half of the reward, they would return to praying standing, even though it was so difficult for them. As for the Prophet wasallam, Allah protected him from that plague and that illness. However, he would feel for his companions and he would make dua to Allah. Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, and this is in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, she says, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa arrived in Al-Madina, Abu Bakr and Bilal fell ill with fever. So I went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and I informed him about that. And so he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allahumma habib ilayna al-Madina kahubbina makkata aw ashad wa sahihha wa barik lana fi sa'iha wa muddiha wanqul humaha the Prophet وسلم, made this dua, O oh Allah, make Medina as dear and beloved to us as Mecca, or even more. O oh Allah, make it healthy. Bless us in its saw and its mud, the two methods of weighing. And so the Prophet وسلم, was praying for barakah in the food. And then he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and O oh Allah, transfer its fever and throw it in Al-Juhfa, outside of al Medina. It was Ibrahim alayhi salam who made dua to Allah for what? For which city? For Mecca. That Allah puts barakah in it. And Allah mentions this in the Quran, his dua. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was asking Allah to double the blessings of al Medina, and that is exactly what ended up happening. Now, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa reached al Medina, he had four major projects to work on. These four projects we're going to talk about and we're going to go through them in the coming weeks, inshallah. The first is the masjid, the building of the masjid. The second is establishing brotherhood between the Ansar and the Muhajirun. The third is the covenant or the peace treaty that he made, which would govern the relationship between the various groups of Al Medina. And the fourth is building a military infrastructure, establishing the army. And so now we move on to the lessons that we can learn from the arrival of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in al Medina, The first lesson that we learn is the importance of establishing a base for the community. A place where everyone can come together to worship Allah and also to learn and to meet. And so we saw this when the Prophet ﷺ immediately, as soon as he reaches the outskirts of Al-Madinah, he hasn't even reached Al-Madinah and he already built a masjid. And so this was, as we mentioned, Masjid Quba. 
and we will see how the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did this again when he arrived in Al Madinah. And so now, the threat of the enemy no longer exists. In Mecca, they were not able to congregate and come together and pray in one place or to build a masjid. But now that they have that opportunity, that was the very first thing that the Prophet ﷺ did. And so this shows us the importance of the masjid. The second lesson that we learn is the beautiful akhlaq of the Prophet ﷺ and how he went about dealing with his hosts and how as a guest he showed us the adab that a guest is supposed to have with with his host and so he made sure that he was not a burden on anyone he would go out of his way to make sure that you know things are convenient for the host and so we saw this when he stayed in the house of the singles in Quba and then when he went to Al Madinah how he stayed in the house of Abu Ayyub al Ansari, but he stayed on the lower level so as not to cause inconvenience to Abu Ayyub al Ansari. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testifying to the akhlaq of the Prophet. وسلم, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa innaka la ala khuluqin azim. Indeed, you, O Muhammad, are of a very high and great moral standard, a very high akhlaq. The third lesson that we learn is that celebrating joyous occasions with displays of happiness and celebration is permissible in Islam. And we see this in this event. How everyone came out and celebrated the arrival of the Prophet ﷺ in Al-Madinah and he sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not object to any of that it was done within the guidelines of islam and the teachings of islam and so this shows us that we are allowed to celebrate joyous moments and occasions in our lives but what we learn from this same event is that what is not permissible is to make that into a seasonal or annual celebration. And so the Prophet ﷺ did not repeat that celebration the following year. Nor did the companions celebrate. They did, they did not make one day of the year to be, this is the day of the Hijrah, or the arrival of the Prophet ﷺ. On this day every year, let's celebrate. They never did that. And so this shows us that we can celebrate any joyous occasion that happens in our lives as long as it is within the guidelines and the teachings of Islam we don't cross we don't cross the boundaries but we do not repeat it we do not make it into an annual thing and so that is the way of Ahlul Kitab the Jews and the Christians and the Kuffar in general where they commemorate certain events in their history by making it a holiday and a day to celebrate. Whereas we Muslims, we only have two celebrations that are repeated every year. And they are the two that the Prophet ﷺ gave to us and said that these are your two days, Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. And so that's why we celebrate the joyous occasion of a newborn baby. We have the aqiqah. But do we celebrate the birthday every year? No. The fourth lesson that we learn is the love that the Ansar had for the Prophet ﷺ and the love that he had for them. We saw this in how the Ansar came and greeted the Prophet ﷺ, and we also saw this in how the Prophet ﷺ responded to them. And so the Prophet ﷺ said to them, Allah knows that my heart loves you all. 
And so this was the relationship that the Prophet ﷺ had with the people of al Medina, And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had chosen the Ansar to be the Ansar, the helpers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's why towards the end of his life, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if it was not for Al-Hijrah, I would consider myself to be a member of the Ansar. Showing us the status of the Ansar and showing us his love that he had for them. The fifth lesson that we learn is that being generous and supportive of Muslims is a sign of one's Iman. It was a sign of the Ansar that earned them the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised them in the Quran. For this very reason, وَالَّذِينَ تَبَوَّأُوا الدَّارَ وَالْإِيمَانَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَا يَجِدُونَ فِي صُدُورِهِمْ حَاجَةً مِمَّا أُوتُوا وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا Look how Allah praises the Ansar. That they are a people who they don't find anything within them. Any hatred, any feelings of resentment for anyone who they are helping. Rather, they sacrifice, they give, meaning to the muhajirun, from what they have, even when they are more in need of what they're giving. Where did the muhajirun stay when they moved from Mecca to al Medina? Did they check into hotels? Or did they stay in refugee camps? No, they stayed in the homes of the Ansar. And that's why we call them the Ansar, the supporters, the helpers. They supported the deen of Allah and the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. And so their houses were open to the Ansar, even though they were very modest, they were very small. Their houses were not like what we have today. It was simply one room. One room, no more than that. Maybe two rooms maximum. They didn't have kitchens, living rooms, bathrooms, just one room. And, and even that was small. Aisha radiallahu anha says that when she would when the Prophet would pray and she was asleep, the Prophet وسلم, his hand would end up touching her feet, showing you how small their houses were. But yet, look at how they opened up their houses for the muhajirun. The final lesson that we learn is the threat, the imminent threat of the Jews and the munafiqun and how this was sensed very early on. It was not something that came about later, right from the very beginning. When the Prophet ﷺ arrives in Al-Medina, their enmity starts to come out. And we see that the common factor between the Jews and the Munafiqun that drove their enmity for Rasulullah ﷺ was one thing. And that was Al-Hasad, envy. And it was this one thing that prevented them from submitting and accepting Islam. And it was this one thing that constantly made them a security threat. Throughout the following years of the Prophet in Al-Medina. And so we know about the Jews and Allah even mentions about their kufr and how it is all based on Al-Hasad. As for the Munafiqun, we saw an example of that. The one who later on becomes the head of the Munafiqun, Abdullah ibn Ubay, he was expecting to become their leader. And so when the Prophet ﷺ arrives and he gets this, he, he receives this huge celebration upon his arrival, we see how his envy comes out. 
and how it will continue in the coming years of the Prophet ﷺ stay in al Medina. And so with that, we come to the end of this event in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Next week, we'll move on to some of the most important steps that the Prophet ﷺ took upon his arrival in al Medina. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wa salli allahumma wa sallim ala nabiyina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa salamu alaykum. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.